Hello, we are live. And I think Andrea's still here. Hello, Andrea, if you're still here. <laughs> All right, so first I just want to talk about um, wand crafting from traditional witchcraft point of view. I'm not sure I like this angle of the camera. You can see my bald head at the top. Um, all right, I'm going to use this as um, an example. This was a wand I actually created for the Abremelin operation. Sorry if my camera keeps um, sort of going all funny. Hi Tashi, I'll um, I'll answer questions. Uh, just, as I said, I just want to go through one crafting first, and then I'll go through all the questions. Um, so I'll try and keep it as brief as brief as possible. Then. All right. So what first of all, what do you use a wand for? Wand is to, or well, it's like most magical tools actually. A wand is actually to just project power, energy, um, but it's it's more of an extension of your body. Um, now. In proper tool making, what you would do is actually work with the spirit of the the thing that you're using to make it. In the case of a wand, it would most likely be a tree. Um, so you you, you know you, you can use other materials, um, but in, especially in traditional witchcraft, it's usually wood. Um, so you would first of all have to consider the dryad. Um, now, the dryad is an old Greek word, actually, for oak, um, but it came to uh, represent all trees, uh, all spirits of trees. And the spirits of the trees, the dryads themselves, they can actually embody just one tree, or they can embody a group of trees, all of the same species. But you also get cases where they actually embody groves of trees of different trees and species. Um, so it's a bit, it's, it's not as contained as you would find with a person who, you know, one person has a spirit and the next person has a spirit. Um, so it's, it's a bit more abstract. Um, but when we actually go or look at um, actually creating a wand or if it's a staff or a stang or something like that, then you want to work with the spirit of the tree. And a lot of people will say that you can just pick up a branch off the ground. In traditional witchcraft, you don't. Uh, so there are three types of wood you can work with. So there's dead wood, um, there's green wood, and there's live wood. Now, dead wood in traditional craft usually don't use it because it's dead. Um, the spirit, the life force, and everything has been removed from it. It still contains the aspects that the tree would embody. Um, but as I say, that life force has, has disappeared. It's, it's come out of the wood itself. So then you can use green wood. Um, green wood is just the life force that's in the actual wood. But the the best to use would be live wood, which means the dryad, the, the tree spirit, has actually sort of broken a piece of itself off and put it into that portion of the tree that you are going to use for the tool. Now, to do this, you obviously need a lot of respect for the, the tree, a lot of respect for the spirit of the tree. And it can take a long time to actually find the right tree. But once you do find the right tree, then you have to approach it properly and give it offerings and things like that. Offerings can be things like milk, honey, uh, water. Um, but you, you need to give those offerings. And hi, Andrea. I'm very well. hope you're well as well. I see you are. <laughs> um, so... You, as I say, you need to approach the tree, you need to approach the spirit of the tree, and you have to work with it over a period of time until it gives you permission to actually use it for the purposes you want to. Um, so once it's, once you've been given the permission, if you are not given the permission when you take the piece of wood, the dryad or the tree spirit is going to remove itself um, from that, that portion of wood that you're using. Um, so it's best to get the permission. Once you've got the permission, then you can go about cutting it. Now, traditionally, what you do is you take a knife and you in you just lop the branch off in one swoop, in one cut. Um, I find this very difficult. But the the tree that you need to, or the, the tool that you need to actually use, and it needs to be extremely sharp to do that. Otherwise, you damage the tree. If you damage the tree, it's going to be very angry with you. So you know. Um, <clears throat> so, what I actually suggest is because uh, I. <clears throat> I've used my my 
my knife and I've sharpened it as much as I can, but to try and cut through a branch in one lop just doesn't work. So because we're in the modern age, uh, and this is what I was alluding to in the, in the previous video, we have modern tools that we can use. And those would be secateurs or pruning shears. Um, if you want to make the cut of a, a piece of branch for a stang, which is a lot thicker, then um, you know use a, a, a saw or something like that. But what I would suggest is, is doing the same type of thing you would do if you if you're you know preparing or creating a knife which is for ritual use. You would only use it for that one thing. So if you get pruning shears um, to cut a piece of a branch, then you know take it, consecrate it, and only use it for that purpose. Um, but there's no reason why we can't use modern tools that we have now that they didn't have back then. Um, so that that's my suggestion, because you can do it without damaging the tree. And respect to all living things is what she taught, exactly. Uh, I agree with Nan. Nan's always right. <laughs> um, so once you've actually got the branch, then you can then prepare the wand itself. Now, the length of a wand is usually from elbow to the tip of the longest finger um, on the outside of the arm. That's that's the ideal length. It can be shorter. You do actually get some really short ones that um, are, are called keppens or pocket ones. Um, <clears throat> But that's that's the ideal length is, is from from the elbow. Let me try and get my camera to catch up with me. From the elbow to the tip of the, the longest finger, which is usually the middle finger. And now what you have with the wand, you've got the butt, the shaft, and the toe. So the butt is where you would hold it. And the butt can be squared off at the end, it can be rounded, or you can actually shape it into a hoof um, just to uh, represent and, and um, or represent the the, the horn god uh, or the the goat god. Um, and then this this part is is actually quite important. Some some people what they do they actually put a little hole in the bottom, or, well, quite a deep hole. And obviously, depending on th how thick it is, you don't want to really go thicker than your thumb. Um, this one's actually about half my thumb width. Um, but you don't want to go thicker than your thumb with a wand. But what they do is they put a, a they put a hole in the bottom and then they put um, objects in. They're usually personal objects, um, hair, nail clippings, things like that, blood, um, whatever they they feel will actually tie the wand to their, their, their themselves, to their personal uh, energy. And then they'll just uh, put a piece of wax in or a, um, a wooden um, cork or something like that just to stop it. Um, what you, some people do, and obviously it needs to be a very straight piece of wood, but they will actually bore a hole right through the wand and then put a copper um, uh, copper rod through the middle just to, to charge it. Um, you can also bore a hole in the bottom and just put a piece of lodestone to charge it. Uh, so there's a few things you can actually do, do with the butt itself. And then the shaft section, that's more decorative. Um, you can put um, glyphs on it. You can put some runes on it. You can carve it. Um, you can put it, carve it into a spiral, for instance, which will be a, um, a snake um, or a vine. And then, you know, as I say, that's the most decorative part of the actual wand. And then the toe itself, which is the top section. Now, this can either, you can taper it from the, from the butt to the toe. Um, but the toe can be flat, it can be rounded, it can be tapered to a point like I've got here. Um, you can actually tie or bind um, some natural objects like natural crystal, stone, metal, um, and things to the end of it just to, you know, if it's, it's again, it's a bit decorative, but it also may hold some, some representation for you. Um, so that anyway, that's the basic wand. Um, let's just check my notes, see if I had anything else in here. Cutting, green wood, live wood. Yeah, so that, that's that's basically one crafting itself. Um, as I say, it, be, it does become very personal to each person. And I'll, 
I don't particularly like buying tools on, online or in shops or things like that, especially things like wands. Um, and when it comes to the actual wood, it's better to actually go and just check the properties of the wood and the aspects of the wood and also see what is um, indigenous to your area. Um, this was actually cut from a mulberry tree. And the place I used to stay, it used to have an out, outbuilding that I used to use my temple room and just outside was a mulberry bush. Um, so I actually took it from there. Oh, uh, when you do cut live wood, don't let it touch the ground. Um, because it's live wood, the dryad has, as I said, split a piece of itself off into the actual wood you're cutting. So if you touch the, if you let the branch that you've just cut touch the ground, then it's going to actually earth um, the energy and the dryad is going to go back to the rest of the tree spirit. Um, so don't let it touch the ground. Um, oh, okay. So once you've got your wand, uh, what do you do with it then? Because it's probably going to have bark on it. So there's two things you can do. You can either decide to strip the bark off or you can leave the bark on and leave it natural. So if you want to strip the bark off, um, do it while it's still uh, wet. All you do is basically just score. Um, you just score a line down the length, and then you can just peel it off banana. Um, or you can leave it natural and just leave the bark on. If you're going to leave the bark on, then you're probably looking at about a year before it dries out. And uh, keep it in a, a cool, um, dark place. If it's if the, the place you're keeping it is too wet, then it's probably it could end up rotting. It's too dry, then it can end up uh, warping. Um, so, the, yeah, okay. So once you've got your wand, what you know, you need to actually just protect it. So, I would suggest just putting a varnish on, just normal uh, varnish. You can use beeswax or linseed oil, but with those, you have to treat it uh, every few months to a year. Um, with the varnish, it just lasts forever, really. You can put another coat on in a few years, but I've had this for years now. I haven't haven't done anything to it. Um, all right, that is ones. That was quick. That was only 12 minutes. Okay, so let's get to questions. Uh, your thoughts on Demon Pact? Um, I don't think it's actually necessary to tell you the truth. Uh, I've done Demon Pacts in the past. Uh, I was a bit more inexperienced at the time, but just sitting down and just speaking to the demon, um, you know, getting to know it, get, actually building up a relationship. That's the main thing, uh, to go and promise things that you might not be able to keep. You know, it's, it's a bit of, uh, it's a bit of a, a shot in the dark. Um, but they're not actually necessary. If you want to do magic for a particular thing, you don't need to actually make a pact. All you need to do is just communicate with the demon and just ask it what you want to ask it. Um, Joel. You have met elder trees. Oh, best left alone. Yes, elder trees. Uh, I've seen some people say that they use elder trees for ones and staffs and such. Other people will say, don't even touch the, the, the goddess or the elder tree. It's one of those things you just want to stay away from. Hazel's very good for ones. Um, just coming back to the whole indigenous tree thing, it's, um, I mean, I'm in South Africa. Um, I mean, my roots are in England. I come from England, but I would love to use blackthorn or something like that for my ones, but just doesn't grow here. Um, you don't find it. Um, elder, I can't, can't think of ever seeing elder anywhere. Or, you know, and most of the trees that you find in in the UK, there's, there's apparently only 35 trees that are indigenous to the UK. And if you add blackthorn and I think it was elder, actually, which are con considered to be a shrub, then there's 37. Um, so there's not that <laughs> actually that many choices. But if you do work in a different country from the UK, then, you know, you're going to have your own indigenous trees, which represent similar things to those trees. So you just need to do a bit of research, go sit with a tree, talk to it, and uh, find out what its properties are. Uh, that stage, where I just use my index finger. Can I use a walking stick? Can be used as a stain. Yes. Um, 
as I say, tools on many extensions. Um, I actually prefer just using my, my finger, my hands, uh, just to That's just my personal preference. Other people prefer the tools. Um, walking stick is great. Um, you can use it as a stand. You can actually tie a, um, some horns to it and use it, use it in that way. But the walking stick is actually very good for creating or doing training in the mill especially plowing the bloody field and things like that, where you are moving in a circle in order to, to induce trance. You actually drag um, the walking stick around. Uh, Mulberry is good, energetically speaking, too. Mul yeah, Mulberry is great. I can't actually remember why I chose to use Mulberry, apart from the fact that it was outside, right outside the doors to, to my temple. But there was a particular aspect and energy that uh, was similar to... Um, the word used in the Bremelin operation, but I can't remember what it was. That was several years back. Um, well, I want one use a staff versus a wand. It, the, you can use a staff or a wand interchangeably. Uh, a lot of people do. There's actually not much of a difference. The staff is just longer. Um, and, you know, if, if you're actually walking in a circle to define the space, to hello the ground and things like that, you know, you can actually, some people will point the wand and they'll walk around um, and project the energy that way. Some people will use a staff and actually drag it around like the walking stick. Um, I, I used to have a, quite a big staff. Um, it got stolen. Uh, it was in my car to come back from rituals and stuff somewhere else and left it in the car, left the car outside and it got stolen. The whole car with all its contents. So that was a bit of a pain. Um, with my dragon staff. Uh, what are some skills required for an, a great magician? I've been. What are some skills required for being a great magician? Oh, skill. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm trying to put that sentence together. Um, some skills. Uh, first of all, I would say stillness. Uh, meditation is very important and actually finding stillness and silence silencing the the inner dialogue um, that's extremely important to magic um, then I would I would suggest actually working with energy uh, learning how it actually flows through the body uh, how the elements actually impact the body in certain areas um, you can you can you can pull in and, and direct the, the the elements, for instance. Um, but it's, it's a whole case of understanding how to actually work with the energy, how to pull it in, how to manipulate it, how to push it out, how to move it around. Um, very important because uh, you know a lot of people they'll cast cast a circle or um, ceremonial circle, what, whatever kind of circle, and they'll go around and all they'll do is just make some actions with their hands and they'll say a few words and they think it's all done but there's no energy in the circle so understanding how that actual how the energy gets pushed out and pulled back in again uh, to fill the circle um you know if, if you're going to go from quarter to quarter and you're working with the elements um pulling in that element into into the space itself and filling it and then pulling the next element in but you know, you, if you don't pull it in properly, you could get a bit of a, a clash between the elements. Um, you know, air bridges between fire and water. So if you haven't got enough air in and fire and water come and clash together, you, you've got a bit of a unstable and unbalanced circle. Um, so yeah, definitely working with the energies, but also stilling the mind. Because if your mind's going crazy with a load of other thoughts, then you know, you can't actually focus and concentrate on what you're supposed to be doing. Um, any thoughts on Beleth? I actually haven't worked with Beleth, so I can't actually give you any answers there. Um, what about consecration of objects? Are there any parallels between one crafting and, say, the consecration of a dagger or knife for the same ritual purposes? Um, you can actually use the same consecration for all objects. A lot of people will um, separate them and, and do something particular to that that tool or that object um, but you can actually consecrate all the objects the same i mean the main basis of consecration would be to cleanse it um, and that cleansing can be done through smoke um, you can sprinkle some water on sprinkle some salt um, but 
you know, it, you can actually use the same consecration method for all tools. Do you offer ritual service? I do. I do um, candle work, uh, candle lightings for people. Um, I was considering doing full-on ritual work for people, but um, I'm not quite sure about that at the moment. Somebody asked me once, and I said it would cost me cost them X amount, and they they ran away because it was a bit too much. Um, so I, I do do candle work, and um, you can get those through my Etsy store. Uh, I'm going to check if I've missed any questions. I don't think I have. What is candle working? <clears throat> um, candle working or candle magic is... It's a, type, well, it's a type of spell work you can actually It's a pleasure, Matthew. Thanks. Um, it's candle working itself. I, I might actually do another video on this. I did do a video last year, uh, which is on the channel, um, showing exactly how to do a candle working. Um, but I like candle working because you set an intent. And while you're dressing the candle, or while I'm dressing the candle, I tend to focus purely on what's what what the outcome is that I want to want to bring about. Um, <clears throat> and it is that one-pointed focus. I'm I'm not thinking about anything else while I'm actually dressing the candle, and it becomes completely one-focused, which is what you need for magic um, in order to transfer it from the conscious to the subconscious mind. Then what you do, you light the candle and that's the reason I like it. It takes several hours for the candle to burn. Um, but you're not thinking about the magic all the time, um, you know, the working you're actually doing. You're not thinking about it constantly. You go about your day and you do everything else. Every now and again, you walk past the candle and you notice the candle and it triggers that, that unconscious um, thought or aspect. And, you know, then you just carry on, carry on with your day. But throughout the day, you keep getting that, that unconscious trigger um, which helps with the magic. Um, it's why I like candle working anyway. Is the energy being pushed to a certain direction? It depends on what you're doing. Um, let me see if I can think of some examples. If, for example, you were creating a talisman or an amulet, uh, which would be a piece of jewelry or an object, even a rock, for instance, uh, that you're putting energy into that you can uh, draw on later. Um, it, may, it may be a protective amulet, for instance, and you, you're pushing energy into that, that amulet. <clears throat> then what you would do is you would pull the energy into your body, the particular energy you're looking for, and it might be um, one of the elements. Um, it may be just... The, the, the idea, the intent of, of protection. But you pull that energy into your body and then what you do, you actually project it out of your body. And there are certain points you can project it out of, depending on what school you're actually um, you know, going with, uh, what school of thought. But um, it's usually like the, the um, third eye area. You can push it out all your fingers, out of the palms. You can push it out your heart, out of your solar plexus. Um, but you would then be directing the energy into that one point. Um, that would be one example. Uh, is energy being pushed to a certain direction? If you are, I'm just trying to think of a, a situation in a circle where you would actually be pushing the energy. Um, you could actually use it in, in a fashion of if you are wanting to balance your own your yourself and you you're finding there's an imbalance of, of a certain energy uh, maybe you've got too much of a, of a particular element maybe you are um, very feisty and, and very quick to anger and things like that which may mean that you've got too much fire element in you then you can actually push that out um, to the direction that you uh, consider fire to be in um, 
and you can then work on the other directions and the other elements and bring those in depending on how much you need to actually balance the whole system so that in that case you can push the energy the energy out um, but yeah it's it depends on, on what you're doing there could be multiple loads of different uh, reasons why you'd be why you would actually be pushing energy out Come on, Christopher, I know you've got lots of questions. You've always got lots of questions. <laughs> I'm actually going to be doing a um, video later in the month uh, on wart cunning and herbalism, and I'm going to get my very good friend, Reverend Kai, on with me because she's a herbalist. Um, so that should be interesting. If you, if you haven't checked out um, Temple of Chaos yet, which Christopher's part of. Um, she is my 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 partner there. Um, so you get to learn from her as well. I get to learn from her still. She's fantastic. Um, what system do you find the best to work with? Um, yeah. <laughs> That's a tough one. That's a really tough one. Um, it depends on what I want to do and how I'm feeling at the time, to be totally honest with you, uh, which is why I usually refer to myself as a chaos magician. Um, in, in that case, what, what, what I mean by chaos magician is that if you know, I go through these stages where I become completely focused on uh, one particular path, and then all of a sudden something will come along and pique my interest on one of the other paths, and I'll, I'll become engrossed in that. So it depends on where I am at the time. Um, at the moment, I'm actually, this year, I'm going down the, the path of uh, Carlos Castaneda and the Toltec Warrior. Um, but I'm also always focused on, on traditional witchcraft. Um, so, you know, to say which system works better, can't say. Um, you can do the same thing with traditional witchcraft as you can with chaos magic or with ceremonial magic or whatever. Um, they all have the same, or they all work the same. Um, but I will say if somebody is trying to do something from a traditional witchcraft point of view, but they're more um, ceremonially, ceremonially inclined, then they'll probably have a bit of difficulty because uh, their heart won't be in it. It's it's about uh, finding your path of heart. Um, any spirit to work with art, aesthetics? Art, 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 art. Can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, just trying to see if any, any of them shout out. might want to look into Jupiterian energy, um, Jupiter itself. Um, seems to be coming through, but nothing, nobody. Um, no, nobody's coming up for me. You didn't break my internet, so you're okay. I'm just trying to think. Anybody know any spirits that can you be used to work for art? Sorry, I'm a, I'm a complete blank there. Muses, yes, actually. There you go. Brilliant. Look to the muses. Um, Greek-based, as far as I remember. I mean, they're, they're not, well, they are spirits, obviously. Calliope. Thank you, Michael. Venus sphere. Yeah, I would have said Jupiter rather than Venus. Uh, Tashi, is it for music or 
Is it for painting, sculpting? Oh, sorry, that was Tashi, music. <laughs> I've got little orange circles here. I'm looking at the colors. Um, for music, um, you, I'm going to say Bach. I'm uh, not Bach. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, Bacchus. Um, he's a bit more of a rough one. Hang on, let's just have a look. Um, related to music. I was hoping Michael would do all the uh, internet, all the Google searching for me. Um, you, know, you see, I don't really know any of these gods, but it's a bit difficult. Ethel, Bess, Isis, and Os Os Osiris. Um, the reason I say Bacchus is because of he is often seen as very musical. I would actually say Pan as well, to be honest with you. They are a bit more wild than what you're probably looking for, though. No, be fine. So this is the problem with doing live. You get all these little errors you can't edit out. Come on, get back to there. Not responding. There we go, I'm back. Sorry about that. All right, I would, I would definitely go with Michael's suggestion. The muses are, are excellent for this um, in any form of art. Okay, did I miss anything now? Christopher still here. No, okay. All right, so has anybody got any other questions or comments or anything like that? Okay, it doesn't look like it. We'll do a last call just in case. Not following me, Andrea. Uh, I think sometimes these things will use these as a means to concentrate the mind. Sorry, you use what? Lost you there. Definitely gonna have to get used to these doing these live things. I'm just wondering if I should do a song and dance now and do a jig or something. Might scare people away though, that's the problem. Okay. Doesn't seem like anybody's got any other questions. So I'm going to end this live stream here. Um, hopefully when we get more people, we can have a second. Uh, there will be more people to ask questions. They call me funny names. All right. Oh, wait. 
How does the process of merging the spirits work in spirit? How does the process of merging, sorry, uh, merging with spirits in a pact? You don't actually, depends what you mean by merging, I have to, I have to say. Um, I mean, to me, merging is bringing two things together um, that cannot be separated afterwards. Um, And you wouldn't merge with the spirit in a pact. So can you ex can you expand on that question a bit, uh, Tashi? Just in case I'm misinterpreting. Uh, <clears throat> let's go to Michael. Um, is there a candle working you do that could help with my current situation? Um, let's see. I would actually do some kind of controlling work. Um, in hoodoo, you would have such things as uh, the essence of bend over. Um, there's actually a lot of controlling aspects in hoodoo. Um, yeah, but my 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 go-to would be to do do a bend over. I use foot track magic. Um, with foot track magic, it's often used um, to basically drive people away, usually, mostly, uh, or to curse people or things like that. But, I mean, you can use foot trap magic for anything. So what you would do, um, I was also reading in Castaneda's book the other night uh, about corn witchcraft, um, specific thing around the whole thing, but and it's usually used to, to kill, be, kill people, but, you know, the principle's there. So um, you use a piece of corn and you use it as a power object. So you put the intent into the piece of corn or the kernel, um, and then you put it in the path of somebody uh, who you want to affect. As they walk over it, that energy transfers into their body. Um, so you can use the same type of principle there, where you take a powder um, or an object, a small object or something like that. Powders are great because you can actually um, put the powder on door handles, on 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 the handles of, of the cars, um, you can put it on desks, things like that. No, you're not happy to kill them, Michael, trust me. <laughs> Stay away from that. Um, but yeah, powders are brilliant to use. And and I mean, with the powder, what you do is just put your intent into the powder and then you, you put it where the person will actually sit, where they'll touch, where they'll walk over, something like that. So it actually transfers the energy into them and then it affects them. Um, there's another great one, and I actually need to publish that video because I it was I did it a year ago, and I didn't actually publish it. Um, it's called the Happiness Technique from Kabbalah that was taught by Yakubus. Um, it's I'll, I think I actually sent you the link. I'm not sure, uh, but I'll send you the link. Just remind me if I don't. Um, basically, with the happy t Happiness Technique, it's great to use on tyrants. Um, and the idea is that you actually find something that you admire about them, which is, can be very difficult, but there's always something you can admire about a person, even if it was a soul they were born with. Um, and then you you well up this this admiration in um, and you it creates this this powerful. And then you project your intent um, from your third eye onto their third eye or onto the back of their neck or their temples. Um, so you project this line of energy with the intent in it. And the principle is that your nefesh actually temporarily communicates with their nefesh and plants the idea. So you plant the idea into them, and then they think that it's their idea and they're brilliant and everything else, but you get what you want at the end of the day. Um, so very good technique. Um, hang on, I think I may have told you that I can see the energy that connects everything. My mother tried to beat it out of me. But after having a wander around Elfheim, it's all coming back to me. Good, I'm glad it's coming back to you, Andrea. Because um, that energy is everywhere. It's spoken about in every tradition and path. Um, we're just, it's been taken out of us uh, as we grew up from, from being children. Um, I was actually uh, mentioned the other, I was talking to uh, Reverend Kai that I was talking about just now. And she was saying she grew up actually believing in spirits and ghosts and fairies and everything else. Um, that's what her parents brought her up with. So she can see them, no problem. It's just been always been a part of her life. Whereas me, I was brought up in a more traditional Western family. And so it kind of, it, 
you know, it gets moved out of you. Um, but it, it's there, and I mean, reality itself is not physical objects. It's it's all energy. So if we can get back to that, then it's a very good thing. How does pact work, essentially? A pact is basically an agreement between you and a spirit where you promise things in order to get something. Um, and this is why I say you don't need to do packs. They're actually unnecessary. Um, they're just not not needed. Um, you can, you know, if you create a relationship with the spirit, then you are that relationship itself gives it energy. But you can also give it offerings, like you would with with a god or a goddess or a nature spirit or something like that. You create an altar or just a little shrine or something, and you give it offerings. It may be food, it may be drink, it may be alcohol, it may be um, little objects, little shiny objects. Um, but they take the energy out of that and that feeds them. Um, so you give them offerings. Because you're giving them offerings and you're talking to them and you're being respectful to them, then they are more inclined to actually help you out. Um, you do, in that case, you don't need a pact. Um, if you just pick up a, you know, just decide on a particular spirit one day, um, that you want, you would like this to, the spirit to give you a particular thing, and you decide, okay, let's make a pact. So, you write out the pact, um, you know, spirit, blah blah blah. Um, I will do X, Y, Z as long as you promise to do A, B, C. And you sign it, put a bit of blood on it. Um, you know, the spirits, there's no relationship, um, so it's not really going to do anything for you. Um, Put some hot foot powder on someone's seat. You can put hot foot powder in it on if you want to drive them away and get rid of them. Um, you did already visit it. Okay, so I did send you the link. Okay. Uh, thank you for the healing. I was awful as to be expected. Then how? I'm glad you're feeling better, Andrea. Um, it's it's definitely my pleasure. Um, <clears throat> I had to person out myself. Then got the most fantastic news. My daughter is going to be back in touch cannot thank you oh that's brilliant I'm, I'm incredibly happy for you I really am uh, I know I, I could sense that you've been through one hell of a ride um, so you definitely deserve all of that happiness and that healing it's it's I'm, I am very happy for you I may not look it because I'm I'm like this all the time <laughs> really I am <laughs> Um, I have to, you, you, we actually need to chat, Andrea, because you, you wanted to come over to the Temple of Chaos. Um, I need to get you on there if you still want to uh, sign up and join. Uh, let's just get back to Michael quickly. You said you put some hot foot powder on someone's seat. Did it work? In Hoodoo, there's actually a whole ritual that goes along with doing hot footing. Uh, what was it again? You uh, sprinkle it where, you, where the person will step over, and you say, you, you whisper your intent, and then you have to actually step back, backwards, a, 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 a odd number of um, steps, and then you turn around and you, you don't look back. Uh, that's the way they do it in Hoodoo anyway. Didn't work. Where did you get your hot foot powder from? Big on herbology, training home, hurry up. Um, okay, well, with the herbology, what I'll do, I'll speak to Kai and just see if she'll do a live like this. Um, I'll just have to set it up on Jitsi or something. Because um, I'm sure you'll have lots of questions for her. Have you read Terry? I'm actually reading Terry Pratchett's books. I decided to go from book one and work my way through um, but with all the other books I'm reading as well it, it's taking quite a long time uh, once it did I was quite spooky as where I put it was related to how he left that's cryptic I bought an eBay once I made my own but that didn't work either just remember, it's about intent, really. Um, 
I mean, even in hoodoo, it's if you're using a hoodoo powder or a hoodoo oil, it's mostly about the intent. I mean, all you're doing, I make them myself and sell them. Um, you know, get lots of people giving me great feedback. But, um, you know, the powder, for instance, the powder is basically corn flour mixed with powdered herbs. And But the intent is, is what makes the magic, mostly. You are working with the spirits of the plants and the roots. Um, but it's... It is mostly about the intent, especially the person who's actually using the powder. So remember to use your intent, and you need to be focused and one-pointed. Um, does candle ritual offer work for love working? I do love working. I do a true love, and I do a fire of desire one. Um, now, the true love is meant to bring your ideal mate to you. So it's a very general working. Fire of desire ignites um, passion in an existing relationship. So you know, a lot of relationships have been together for years. Um, they kind of lose the passion after a while. So that's intended to actually bring that passion back. Um, any other type of love working, I don't do. Um, I don't break up relationships just because somebody is jealous. Uh, nothing like that. Um, I use a spirit and use it for artwork. There you go. Andrea uses uses the muses, uses the muses. That's great. I'm, I'm a poet. Didn't even know it. Um, and she says Saint Cecilia for music. There you go. Thanks, Andrea. Much appreciated. Uh, when it worked, I put it on his bike. He left because of an incident related to that bike. Ah, that's perfect. Um, I think the other problem is it's not going to work all the time. Um, you know, I, th I think, Michael, you understand magic enough to understand that sometimes you're just going to have those bad days. Um, you are going to lust after results, which is going to affect the, the magic itself and the intention. Um, and some people are just they've got their heels stuck in too, too tightly and they just stay as much as you try and affect it, but you just have to go about it a different way. Um, any thoughts on Tiphonian Trilogy? I don't have any thoughts on Tiphonian tri Trilogy, sorry. Uh, Muse for Music is Saint Cecilia. Saint Cecilia, yeah, Cecilia, there you go. Oh, okay, not Cecilia, la. Saint Cecilia for music. Series by Grant, oh, Kenneth Grant. I haven't read it. I haven't read the Tiffany trilogy. Um, I find Kenneth Grant to be very difficult to read, to be honest with you. It's just, I don't know why, there's just some authors that kind of, I try and focus on, I just can't keep the focus. I'm terrible that way. Pleasure, Michael. Have a good one. Was it Kenneth Grant? I think it was Kenneth Grant I'm talking about. Hang on. Where was that book now? Oh, there it is. Yeah. That was the Crowley and the Hidden God. Started reading it. Just didn't, did not pique my interest. Uh, has Nan moved in with you yet? No, she hasn't. And I think she's over-exaggerating that I keep my place immaculate because at the moment it's definitely not immaculate. I need to clean it tomorrow. <laughs> oh, she left you. <laughs> okay, well, it's coming up to an hour, so I'm going to... Shall we, shall we cut off now? As I said, I'm going to do a live at the same time every Friday. Uh, so I'll do a bit of a video uh, speaking about whatever topic it is, and then we'll just go into this live chat and questions. Um, so I'm going to end it now. Thanks for joining, everybody. Much appreciated. Uh, as I say, once we get more people going, 
we'll get more flow, we'll get more questions, and we can go a bit longer. And uh, so I'll see you, or I'll see you, or you'll see me next week on the live, but I'll, uh, I'll be putting up a video on Tuesday again. So have a great weekend, everybody. And cheers. <laughs>